U.S. History, an OpenStax textbook. Read along with the full text at www.openstax.org. You can find this audiobook anywhere you listen to podcasts, including Spotify, YouTube, Apple Podcasts, and more. Chapter 11. A Nation on the Move. Westward Expansion, 1800 to 1860. Introduction. After 1800, the United States militantly expanded westward across North America, confident of its right and duty to gain control of the continent and spread the benefits of its superior culture. In John Gast's American Progress, the white, blonde figure of Columbia, a historical personification of the United States, strides triumphantly westward with the star of empire on her head. She brings education, symbolized by the schoolbook and modern technology, represented by the telegraph wire. White settlers follow her lead, driving the native peoples away and bringing successive waves of technological progress in their wake. In the first half of the 19th century, the quest for control of the West led to the Louisiana Purchase, the annexation of Texas, and the Mexican-American War. Efforts to seize Western territories from native peoples and expand the Republic by warring with Mexico succeeded beyond expectations. Few nations ever expanded so quickly. Yet, this expansion led to debates about the fate of slavery in the West, creating tensions between North and South that ultimately led to the collapse of American democracy and a brutal civil war. Eleven point one, Lewis and Clark. Learning objectives. By the end of this section, you will be able to explain the significance of the Louisiana Purchase, describe the terms of the Adams Onis Treaty, describe the role played by the filibuster in American expansion. For centuries, Europeans had mistakenly believed an all-water route across the North American continent existed. This Northwest Passage would afford the country that controlled it not only access to the interior of North America, but also, more importantly, a relatively quick route to the Pacific Ocean and to trade with Asia. The Spanish, French, and British searched for years before American explorers took up the challenge of finding it. Indeed, shortly before Lewis and Clark set out on their expedition for the U.S. government, Alexander Mackenzie, an officer of the British Northwest Company, a fur trading outfit, had attempted to discover the route. Mackenzie made it to the Pacific and even believed, erroneously, he had discovered the headwaters of the Columbia River, but he could not find an easy water route with a minimum of difficult portages, that is spots where boats must be carried over land. Many Americans also dreamed of finding a Northwest Passage and opening the Pacific to American commerce and influence, including President Thomas Jefferson. In April 1803, Jefferson achieved his goal of purchasing the Louisiana Territory from France, effectively doubling the size of the United States. The purchase was made possible due to events outside the nation's control. With the success of the Haitian Revolution, an uprising of enslaved people against the French, France's Napoleon abandoned his quest to re-establish an extensive French empire in America. As a result, he was amenable to selling off the vast Louisiana Territory. President Jefferson quickly set out to learn precisely what he had bought and to assess its potential for commercial exploitation. Above all else, Jefferson wanted to exert U.S. control over the territory, an area already well known to French and British explorers. It was therefore vital for the United States to explore and map the land to pave the way for future white settlement. Jefferson's Corps of Discovery heads west. To head the expedition into the Louisiana Territory, Jefferson appointed his friend and personal secretary, 29-year-old Army Captain Meriwether Lewis, who was instructed to form a Corps of Discovery. Lewis, in turn, selected William Clark, 
who had once been his commanding officer, to help him lead the group. Jefferson wanted to improve the ability of American merchants to access the ports of China. Establishing a river route from St. Louis to the Pacific Ocean was crucial to capturing a portion of the fur trade that had proven so profitable to Great Britain. He also wanted to legitimize American claims to the land against rivals, such as Great Britain and Spain. Lewis and Clark were thus instructed to map the territory through which they would pass and to explore all tributaries of the Missouri River. This part of the expedition struck fear into Spanish officials, who believed that Lewis and Clark would encroach on New Mexico, the northern part of New Spain. Spain dispatched four unsuccessful expeditions from Santa Fe to intercept the explorers. Jefferson also tasked Lewis and Clark with paving the way for American trade among the Western tribes. Establishing an overland route to the Pacific would bolster U.S. claims to the Pacific Northwest, first established in 1792 when Captain Robert Gray sailed his ship Columbia into the mouth of the river that now bears his vessel's name and forms the present-day border between Oregon and Washington. Finally, Jefferson, who had a keen interest in science and nature, ordered Lewis and Clark to take extensive notes on the geography, plant life, animals, and natural resources of the region into which they would journey. After spending the winter of 1803 to 1804 encamped at the mouth of the Missouri River while the men prepared for their expedition, the Corps set off in May 1804. Although the 33 frontiersmen, boatmen, and hunters took with them Alexander Mackenzie's account of his explorations and the best maps they could find, they did not have any real understanding of the difficulties they would face. Fierce storms left them drenched and freezing. Enormous clouds of gnats and mosquitoes swarmed about their heads as they made their way up the Missouri River. Along the way, they encountered and killed a variety of animals including elk, buffalo, and grizzly bears. One member of the expedition survived a rattlesnake bite. As the men collected minerals and specimens of plants and animals, the overly curious Lewis sampled minerals by tasting them and became seriously ill at one point. What they did not collect, they sketched and documented in the journals they kept. They also noted the customs of the tribes who controlled the land and attempted to establish peaceful relationships with them in order to ensure that future white settlement would not be impeded. The Corps spent their first winter in the wilderness, 1804 to 1805, in a Mandan village in what is now North Dakota. There, they encountered a reminder of France's former vast North American empire when they met a French fur trapper named Toussaint Charbonneau. When the Corps left in the spring of 1805, Charbonneau accompanied them as a guide and interpreter, bringing Sacagawea, who had been kidnapped and sold to Charbonneau, who made her his wife and their newborn son. Charbonneau knew the land better than the Americans, and Sacagawea proved invaluable as an interpreter and diplomat to the Shoshone people. The presence of a young woman and her infant convinced many groups that the expedition was not a war party and meant no harm. The Corps set about making friends with native tribes while simultaneously attempting to assert American power over the territory. Hoping to overawe the people of the land, Lewis would let out a blast of his air rifle, a relatively new piece of technology the Native Americans had never seen. The Corps also followed Native custom by distributing gifts, including shirts, ribbons, and kettles, as a sign of goodwill. The explorers presented Native leaders with medallions, many of which bore Jefferson's image and invited them to visit their new ruler in the East. These medallions or peace medals were meant to allow future explorers to identify friendly Native groups. Not all efforts to assert U.S. control went peacefully. Some Indians rejected the explorers' intrusion onto their land. Lewis unintentionally created tension with the Blackfeet by discussing trade deals made with their traditional enemies. The encounter turned hostile, and members of the Corps killed two Blackfeet men. After spending 18 long months on the trail and nearly starving to death in the Bitterroot Mountains of Montana, 
the core of discovery finally reached the Pacific Ocean in 1805 and spent the winter of 1805 to 1806 in Oregon. They returned to St. Louis later in 1806, having lost only one man, who had died of appendicitis. Upon their return, Meriwether Lewis was named governor of the Louisiana Territory. Unfortunately, he died only three years later in circumstances that are still disputed, before he could write a complete account of what the expedition had discovered. Although the Corps of Discovery failed to find an all-water route to the Pacific Ocean, for none existed, it nevertheless accomplished many of the goals Jefferson had set. The men traveled across the North American continent and established relationships with many Native American tribes, paving the way for fur traders like John Jacob Astor, who later established trading posts solidifying U.S. claims to Oregon. Delegates of several tribes did go to Washington to meet the president. Hundreds of plant and animal specimens were collected, several of which were named for Lewis and Clark in recognition of their efforts. And the territory was now more accurately mapped and legally claimed by the United States. Nonetheless, most of the vast territory, home to a variety of native peoples, remained unknown to Americans. Americana a selection of hats for the fashionable gentleman. Beaver hats were popular apparel in the 18th and 19th centuries in both Europe and the United States because they were naturally waterproof and bore a glossy sheen. Demand for beaver pelts, and for the pelts of sea otters, foxes, and martens, by hat makers, dressmakers, and tailors led many fur trappers into the wilderness in pursuit of riches and encouraged trade and relationships with Native American nations. Beaver hats fell out of fashion in the 1850s when silk hats became the rage, and beaver became harder to find. In some parts of the West, the animals had been hunted nearly to extinction. Are there any contemporary fashions or fads that likewise promise to alter the natural world? Spanish Florida and the adams onis Treaty Despite the Lewis and Clark expedition, the boundaries of the Louisiana Purchase remained contested. Expansionists chose to believe the purchase included vast stretches of land, including all of Spanish Texas. The Spanish government disagreed, however. The first attempt to resolve this issue took place in February 1819 with the signing of the adams onis Treaty, which was actually intended to settle the problem of Florida. Spanish Florida had presented difficulties for its neighbors since the settlement of the original North American colonies first for England and then for the United States. By 1819, American settlers no longer feared attack by Spanish troops garrisoned in Florida, but militant groups within the Creek and Seminole nations raided Georgia and then retreated to the relative safety of the Florida wilderness. These tribes also sheltered self-emancipated enslaved people, often intermarrying with them and making them members of their tribes. Sparsely populated by Spanish colonists and far from both Mexico City and Madrid, the frontier in Florida proved next to impossible for the Spanish government to control. In March 1818, General Andrew Jackson, frustrated by his inability to punish Creek and Seminole raiders, pursued them across the international border into Spanish Florida. Under Jackson's command, U.S. troops aided by Cherokees and Creeks defeated the Creek and Seminole militants, occupied several Florida settlements, and executed two British citizens accused of acting against the United States. Outraged by the U.S. invasion of its territory, the Spanish government demanded that Jackson and his troops withdraw. In agreeing to the withdrawal, however, U.S. Secretary of State John Quincy Adams also offered to purchase the colony. Realizing that conflict between the United States and the Creek and Seminole fighters would continue, Spain opted to cede the Spanish colony to its northern neighbor. The adams onis Treaty, named for Adams and the Spanish ambassador, Luis de Onis, made the cession of Florida official while also setting the boundary between the United States and Mexico at the Sabine River. In exchange, Adams gave up U.S. claims to lands west of the Sabine and forgave Spain's $5 million debt to the United States. 
The Adams Onus Treaty upset many American expansionists who criticized Adams for not laying claim to all of Texas, which they believed had been included in the Louisiana Purchase. In the summer of 1819, James Long, a planter from Natchez, Mississippi, became a filibuster, or a private, unauthorized military adventurer, when he led 300 men on an expedition across the Sabine River to take control of Texas. Long's men succeeded in capturing the Cogdoches, writing a Declaration of Independence, and setting up a Republican government. Spanish troops drove them out a month later. Returning in 1820 with a much smaller force, Long was arrested by the Spanish authorities, imprisoned, and killed. Long was but one of many 19th century American filibusters who aimed at seizing territory in the Caribbean and Central America. Defining American The Long Expedition's Declaration of Independence The Long Expedition's short-lived Republic of Texas was announced with the drafting of a Declaration of Independence in 1819. The Declaration named settlers' grievances against the limits put on expansion by the adams onis Treaty and expressed their fears of Spain. The citizens of Texas have long indulged the hope that in the adjustment of the boundaries of the Spanish possessions in America and of the territories of the United States, that they should be included within the limits of the latter. The claims of the United States, long and strenuously urged, encourage the hope. The recent adams onis Treaty between Spain and the United States of America has dissipated an illusion too long fondly cherished and has roused the citizens of Texas. They have seen themselves literally abandoned to the dominion of the crown of Spain and left a prey to all those exactions which Spanish rapacity is fertile in devising. The citizens of Texas would have proved themselves unworthy of the age, unworthy of their ancestry, of the kindred of the republics of the American continent, could they have hesitated in this emergency, spurning the fetters of colonial vassalage, disdaining to submit to the most atrocious despotism that ever disgraced the annals of Europe, they have resolved under the blessing of God to be free. How did the filibusters view Spain? What do their actions say about the nature of American society and of U.S. expansion? Eleven point two, the Missouri Crisis. Learning objectives. By the end of this section, you will be able to explain why the North and South differed over the admission of Missouri as a state. Explain how the admission of new states to the Union threatened to upset the balance between free and slave states in Congress. Another stage of U.S. expansion took place when inhabitants of Missouri began petitioning for statehood beginning in 1817. The Missouri Territory had been part of the Louisiana Purchase and was the first part of that vast acquisition to apply for statehood. By 1818, tens of thousands of settlers had flocked to Missouri, including slaveholders who brought with them some 10,000 enslaved people. When the status of the Missouri Territory was taken up in earnest in the U.S. House of Representatives in early 1819, its admission to the Union proved to be no easy matter since it brought to the surface a violent debate over whether slavery would be allowed in the new state. Politicians had sought to avoid the issue of slavery ever since the 1787 Constitutional Convention arrived at an uneasy compromise in the form of the Three-Fifths Clause. This provision stated that the entirety of a state's free population and 60% of its enslaved population would be counted in establishing the number of that state's members in the House of Representatives and the size of its federal tax bill. Although slavery existed in several northern states at the time, the compromise had angered many northern politicians because, they argued, the extra population of enslaved people would give southern states more votes than they deserved in both the House and the Electoral College. Admitting Missouri as a slave state also threatened the tenuous balance between free and slave states in the Senate by giving slave states a two-vote advantage. The debate about representation shifted to the morality of slavery itself when New York Representative James Tallmadge, an opponent of slavery, 
attempted to amend the statehood bill in the House of Representatives. Talmadge proposed that Missouri be admitted as a free state, that no more enslaved people be allowed to enter Missouri after it achieved statehood, and that all enslaved children born there after its admission be freed at age 25. The amendment shifted the terms of debate by presenting slavery as an evil to be stopped. Northern representatives supported the Talmadge Amendment, denouncing slavery as immoral and opposed to the nation's founding principles of equality and liberty. Southerners in Congress rejected the amendment as an attempt to gradually abolish slavery, not just in Missouri, but throughout the Union, by violating the property rights of slaveholders and their freedom to take their property wherever they wished. Slavery's apologists, who had long argued that slavery was a necessary evil, now began to perpetuate the idea that slavery was a positive good for the United States. They asserted that it generated wealth and left white men free to exercise their true talents instead of toiling in the soil, as the descendants of Africans were better suited to do. Enslaved people were cared for, supporters argued, and were better off exposed to the teachings of Christianity as enslaved than living as free heathens in uncivilized Africa. Above all, the United States had a destiny, they argued, to create an empire of slavery throughout the Americas. These pro-slavery arguments were to be made repeatedly and forcefully as expansion to the West proceeded. Most disturbing for the unity of the young nation, however, was that debaters divided along sectional lines, not party lines. With only a few exceptions, Northerners supported the Talmadge Amendment regardless of party affiliation, and Southerners opposed it, despite having party differences on other matters. It did not pass, and the crisis over Missouri led to strident calls of disunion and threats of civil war. Congress finally came to an agreement called the Missouri Compromise in 1820. Missouri and Maine, which had been part of Massachusetts, would enter the Union at the same time, Maine as a free state, Missouri as a slave state. The Tall Madge Amendment was narrowly rejected. The balance between free and slave states was maintained in the Senate, and Southerners did not have to fear that Missouri slaveholders would be deprived of their human property. To prevent similar conflicts each time a territory applied for statehood, a line coinciding with the southern border of Missouri, at latitude 36 degrees 30 minutes, was drawn across the remainder of the Louisiana Territory. Slavery could exist south of this line, but was forbidden north of it, with the obvious exception of Missouri. My story, Thomas Jefferson on the Missouri Crisis. On April 22, 1820, Thomas Jefferson wrote to John Holmes to express his reaction to the Missouri crisis, especially the open threat of disunion and war. I thank you, dear sir, for the copy you have been so kind as to send me of the letter to your constituents on the Missouri question. It is a perfect justification to them. I had for a long time ceased to read the newspapers or pay any attention to public affairs, confident they were in good hands and content to be a passenger in our bark to the shore from which I am not distant. But this momentous question, that is, over slavery in Missouri, like a fire bell in the night, awakened and filled me with terror. I considered it at once as the knell of the Union. It is hushed indeed for the moment, but this is a reprieve only, not a final sentence. A geographical line coinciding with a marked principle, moral and political, once conceived and held up to the angry passions of men, will never be obliterated, and every new irritation will mark it deeper and deeper. I can say with conscious truth that there is not a man on earth who would sacrifice more than I would to relieve us from this heavy reproach in any practicable way. I regret that I am now to die in the belief that the useless sacrifice of themselves by the generation of 76 to acquire self-government and happiness to their country is to be thrown away by the unwise and unworthy passions of their sons, and that my only consolation is to be that I live not to weep over it. If they would but dispassionately weigh the blessings they will throw away against an abstract principle more likely to be affected by union than by scission, 
They would pause before they would perpetuate this act of suicide themselves and of treason against the hopes of the world. To yourself as the faithful advocate of union, I tender the offering of my high esteem and respect. Thomas Jefferson How would you characterize the former president's reaction? What do you think he means by writing that the Missouri Compromise Line is a reprieve only, not a final sentence? Eleven point three Independence for Texas. Learning objectives. By the end of this section, you will be able to explain why American settlers in Texas sought independence from Mexico. Discuss early attempts to make Texas independent of Mexico. Describe the relationship between Anglo Americans and Tejanos in Texas before and after independence. As the incursions of the earlier filibusters into Texas demonstrated. American expansionists had desired this area of Spain's empire in America for many years. After the 1819 Adams Onis Treaty established the boundary between Mexico and the United States, more American expansionists began to move into the northern portion of Mexico's province of Coahuila y Texas. Following Mexico's independence from Spain in 1821, American settlers immigrated to Texas. In even larger numbers, intent on taking the land from the new and vulnerable Mexican nation in order to create a new American slave state. American settlers moved to Texas. After the 1819 Adams Onis Treaty defined the U.S. Mexico boundary, the Spanish Mexican government began actively encouraging Americans to settle their northern province. Texas was sparsely settled. And the few Mexican farmers and ranchers who lived there were under constant threat of attack by tribes, especially the Comanche Empire, which supplemented its hunting with raids in pursuit of horses and cattle. To increase the non native population in Texas, provide a buffer zone between its tribes and the rest of Mexico, and provide a bulwark against potential American expansion, Spain began to recruit empresarios. An empresario was someone who brought settlers to the region in exchange for generous grants of land. Moses Austin, a once prosperous entrepreneur reduced to poverty by the Panic of 1819, requested permission to settle 300 English speaking American residents in Texas. Spain agreed on the condition that the resettled people convert to Roman Catholicism. On his deathbed in 1821, Austin asked his son Stephen to carry out his plans. And Mexico, which had won independence from Spain the same year, allowed Stephen to take control of his father's grant. Like Spain, Mexico also wished to encourage settlement in the state of Coahuila y Texas and passed colonization laws to encourage immigration. Thousands of Americans, primarily from slave states, flocked to Texas and quickly came to outnumber the Tejanos, the Mexican residents of the region. The soil and climate offered good opportunities to expand slavery and the cotton kingdom. Land was plentiful and offered at generous terms. Unlike the U.S. government, Mexico allowed buyers to pay for their land in installments and did not require a minimum purchase. Furthermore, to many white people, it seemed not only their God given right, but also their patriotic duty to populate the lands beyond the Mississippi River. Bringing with them American slavery, culture, laws, and political traditions. The Texas War for Independence. Many Americans who migrated to Texas at the invitation of the Mexican government did not completely shed their identity or loyalty to the United States. They brought American traditions and expectations with them, including, for many, the right to enslave individuals. For instance, The majority of these new settlers were Protestant, and though they were not required to attend the Catholic Mass, Mexico's prohibition on the public practice of other religions upset them, and they routinely ignored it. Accustomed to representative democracy, jury trials, and the defendant's right to appear before a judge, the Anglo American settlers in Texas also disliked the Mexican legal system, which provided for an initial hearing by an alcalde. An administrator who often combined the duties of mayor, judge, and law enforcement officer. The alcalde sent a written record of the proceeding to a judge in Saltillo, 
the state capital, who decided the outcome. Settlers also resented that at most two Texas representatives were allowed in the state legislature. Their greatest source of discontent, though, was the Mexican government's 1829 abolition of slavery. Most American settlers were from southern states, and many had brought enslaved people with them. Mexico tried to accommodate them by maintaining the fiction that the enslaved workers were indentured servants. But American slaveholders in Texas distrusted the Mexican government and wanted Texas to be a new U.S. slave state. The dislike of most for Roman Catholicism, the prevailing religion of Mexico, and a widely held belief in American racial superiority led them generally to regard Mexicans as dishonest, ignorant, and backward. Belief in their own superiority inspired some Texans to try to undermine the power of the Mexican government. When Empresario Hayden Edwards attempted to evict people who had settled his land grant before he gained title to it, the Mexican government nullified its agreement with him. Outraged, Edwards and a small party of men took prisoner the alcalde of Nacogdoches. The Mexican army marched to the town, and Edwards and his troop then declared the formation of the Republic of Fredonia between the Sabine and Rio Grande rivers. To demonstrate loyalty to their adopted country, a force led by Stephen Austin hastened to Nacogdoches to support the Mexican army. Edwards' revolt collapsed, and the revolutionaries fled Texas. The growing presence of American settlers in Texas, their reluctance to abide by Mexican law, and their desire for independence caused the Mexican government to grow wary. In 1830, it forbade future U.S. immigration and increased its military presence in Texas. Settlers continued to stream illegally across the long border. By 1835, after immigration resumed, there were 20,000 Anglo-Americans in Texas. 55 delegates from the Anglo-American settlements gathered in 1822 to demand the suspension of customs duties, the resumption of immigration from the United States, the granting of promised land titles, and the creation of an independent state of Texas separate from Coahuila. Ordered to disband, the delegates reconvened in early April 1833 to write a constitution for an independent Texas. Surprisingly, General Antonio Lopez de Santa Anna, Mexico's new president, agreed to all demands, except the call for statehood. Coahuila e Texas made provisions for jury trials, increased Texas's representation in the state legislature, and removed restrictions on commerce. Texans' hopes for independence were quashed in 1834, however, when Santa Ana dismissed the Mexican Congress and abolished all state governments, including that of Coahuila e Texas. In January 1835, reneging on earlier promises, he dispatched troops to the town of Anahuac to collect customs duties. Lawyer and soldier William B. Travis and a small force marched on Anahuac in June, and the fort surrendered. On October 2nd, Anglo-American forces met Mexican troops at the town of Gonzales. The Mexican troops fled, and the Americans moved on to take San Antonio. Now more cautious, delegates to the consultation of 1835 at San Felipe de Austin voted against declaring independence, instead drafting a statement, which became known as the Declaration of Causes, promising continued loyalty if Mexico returned to a constitutional form of government. They selected Henry Smith, leader of the Independence Party, as governor of Texas and placed Sam Houston, a former soldier who had been a congressman and governor of Tennessee, in charge of its small military force. The consultation delegates met again in March 1836. They declared their independence from Mexico and drafted a constitution calling for an American-style judicial system and an elected president and legislature. Significantly, they also established that slavery would not be prohibited in Texas. Many wealthy Tejanos supported the push for independence, hoping for liberal governmental reforms and economic benefits. Remember the Alamo. Mexico had no intention of losing its northern province. 
Santa Anna and his army of 4,000 had besieged San Antonio in February 1836. Hopelessly outnumbered, its 200 defenders, under Travis, fought fiercely from their refuge in an old mission known as the Alamo. After 10 days, however, the mission was taken, and all but a few of the defenders were dead, including Travis and James Bowie, the famed frontiersman who was also a land speculator and slave trader. A few male survivors, possibly including the frontier legend and former Tennessee congressman Davy Crockett, were led outside the walls and executed. The few women and children inside the mission were allowed to leave with the only adult male survivor, a person enslaved by Travis, who was then freed by the Mexican army. Terrified, they fled. Although hungry for revenge, the Texas forces under Sam Houston nevertheless withdrew across Texas, gathering recruits as they went. Coming upon Santa Ana's encampment on the banks of San Jacinto River on April 21, 1836, they waited as the Mexican troops settled for an afternoon nap. Assured by Houston that victory is certain and told to trust in God and fear not, the 700 men descended on a sleeping force nearly twice their number with cries of, Remember the Alamo! Within 15 minutes, the Battle of San Jacinto was over. Approximately half the Mexican troops were killed, and the survivors, including Santa Ana, taken prisoner. Santa Ana grudgingly signed a peace treaty and was sent to Washington, where he met with President Andrew Jackson and, under pressure, agreed to recognize an independent Texas with the Rio Grande River as its southwestern border. By the time the agreement had been signed, however, Santa Ana had been removed from power in Mexico. For that reason, the Mexican Congress refused to be bound by Santa Ana's promises and continued to insist that the renegade territory still belonged to Mexico. The Lone Star Republic In September 1836, military hero Sam Houston was elected president of Texas, and following the relentless logic of U.S. expansion, Texans voted in favor of annexation to the United States. This had been the dream of many settlers in Texas all along. They wanted to expand the United States West and saw Texas as the next logical step. Slaveholders there, such as Sam Houston, William B. Travis, and James Bowie, the latter two of whom died at the Alamo, believed too in the destiny of slavery. Mindful of the vicious debates over Missouri, that had led to talk of disunion and war, American politicians were reluctant to annex Texas, or indeed even to recognize it as a sovereign nation. Annexation would almost certainly mean war with Mexico, and the admission of a state with a large enslaved population, though permissible under the Missouri Compromise, would bring the issue of slavery once again to the fore. Texas had no choice but to organize itself as the independent Lone Star Republic, to protect itself from Mexican attempts to reclaim it, Texas sought and received recognition from France, Great Britain, Belgium, and the Netherlands. The United States did not officially recognize Texas as an independent nation until March 1837, nearly a year after the final victory over the Mexican army at San Jacinto. Uncertainty about its future did not discourage Americans committed to expansion especially slaveholders, from rushing to settle in the Lone Star Republic, however. Between 1836 and 1846, its population nearly tripled. By 1840, nearly 12,000 enslaved Africans had been brought to Texas by American slaveholders. Many new settlers had suffered financial losses in the severe financial depression of 1837 and hoped for a new start in the new nation. According to folklore across the United States, homes and farms were deserted overnight, and curious neighbors found notes reading only GT, meaning gone to Texas. Many Europeans, especially Germans, also immigrated to Texas during this period. Americans in Texas generally treated both Tejano and Native American residents with utter contempt, eager to displace and dispossess them. Anglo-American leaders failed to return the support their Tejano neighbors had extended during the rebellion 
and repaid them by seizing their lands. In 1839, Miro B. Lamar, the second president of the Lone Star Republic, instituted a program of ethnic cleansing aimed at pushing all Native American tribes out of Texas. The impulse to expand did not lay dormant, and Anglo-American settlers and leaders in the newly formed Texas Republic soon cast their gaze on the Mexican province of New Mexico as well. Repeating the tactics of earlier filibusters, a Texas force set out in 1841 intent on taking Santa Fe. Its members encountered an army of New Mexicans and were taken prisoner and sent to Mexico City. On Christmas Day, 1842, Texans avenged a Mexican assault on San Antonio by attacking the Mexican town of Mir. In August, another Texas army was sent to attack Santa Fe, but Mexican troops forced them to retreat. Clearly, hostilities between Texas and Mexico had not ended simply because Texas had declared its independence. Eleven point four, the Mexican-American War, eighteen forty-six to eighteen forty-eight. Learning objectives. By the end of this section, you will be able to identify the causes of the Mexican-American War, describe the outcomes of the war in eighteen forty-eight, especially the Mexican Cession, describe the effect of the California Gold Rush on westward expansion. Tensions between the United States and Mexico rapidly deteriorated in the eighteen forties as American expansionists eagerly eyed Mexican land to the west, including the lush northern Mexican province of California. Indeed, in 1842, a U.S. naval fleet, incorrectly believing war had broken out, seized Monterey, California, a part of Mexico. Monterey was returned the next day, but the episode only added to the uneasiness with which Mexico viewed its northern neighbor. The forces of expansion, however, could not be contained, and American voters elected James Polk in 1844 because he promised to deliver more lands. President Polk fulfilled his promise by gaining Oregon and, most spectacularly, provoking a war with Mexico that ultimately fulfilled the wildest fantasies of expansionists. By 1848, the United States encompassed much of North America a republic that stretched from the Atlantic to the Pacific. James K. Polk and the Triumph of Expansion A fervent belief in expansion gripped the United States in the 1840s. In 1845, a New York newspaper editor, John O'Sullivan, introduced the concept of manifest destiny to describe the very popular idea of the special role of the United States in overspreading the continent the divine right and duty of white Americans to seize and settle the American West, thus spreading Protestant democratic values. In this climate of opinion, voters in 1844 elected James K. Polk, a slaveholder from Tennessee, because he vowed to annex Texas as a new slave state and take Oregon. Annexing Oregon was an important objective for U.S. foreign policy, because it appeared to be an area rich in commercial possibilities. Northerners favored U.S. control of Oregon because ports in the Pacific Northwest would be gateways for trade with Asia. Southerners hoped that in exchange for their support of expansion into the Northwest, Northerners would not oppose plans for expansion into the Southwest. President Polk, whose campaign slogan in 1844 had been 5440 or fight, asserted the United States' right to gain full control of what was known as Oregon Country from its southern border at 42 degrees latitude, the current boundary with California, to its northern border at 54 degrees, 40 minutes latitude. According to an 1818 agreement, Great Britain and the United States held joint ownership of this territory, but the 1827 Treaty of Joint Occupation opened the land to settlement by both countries. Realizing that the British were not willing to cede all claims to the territory, Polk proposed the land be divided at 49 degrees latitude, the current border between Washington and Canada. The British, however, denied U.S. claims to land north of the Columbia River, Oregon's current northern border, 
Indeed, the British Foreign Secretary refused even to relay Polk's proposal to London. However, reports of the difficulty Great Britain would face defending Oregon in the event of a U.S. attack, combined with concerns over affairs at home and elsewhere in its empire, quickly changed the minds of the British, and in June 1846, Queen Victoria's government agreed to a division at the 49th parallel. In contrast to the diplomatic solution with Great Britain over Oregon when it came to Mexico, Polk and the American people proved willing to use force to wrest more land for the United States. In keeping with voters' expectations, President Polk set his sights on the Mexican state of California. After the mistaken capture of Monterey, negotiations about purchasing the port of San Francisco from Mexico broke off until September 1845. Then, following a revolt in California that left it divided in two, Polk attempted to purchase Upper California and New Mexico as well. These efforts went nowhere. The Mexican government, angered by U.S. actions, refused to recognize the independence of Texas. Finally, after nearly a decade of public clamoring for the annexation of Texas, in December 1845, Polk officially agreed to the annexation of the former Mexican state, making the Lone Star Republic an additional slave state. Incensed that the United States had annexed Texas, however, the Mexican government refused to discuss the matter of selling land to the United States. Indeed, Mexico refused even to acknowledge Polk's emissary, John Slidell, who had been sent to Mexico City to negotiate. Not to be deterred, Polk encouraged Thomas O. Larkin, the U.S. consul in Monterey, to assist any American settlers and any Californios, the Mexican residents of the state, who wished to proclaim their independence from Mexico. By the end of 1845, having broken diplomatic ties with the United States over Texas and having grown alarmed by American actions in California, the Mexican government warily anticipated the next move. It did not have long to wait. War with Mexico, 1846 to 1848. Expansionistic fervor propelled the United States to war against Mexico in 1846. The United States had long argued that the Rio Grande was the border between Mexico and the United States. And at the end of the Texas War for Independence, Santa Ana had been pressured to agree. Mexico, however, refused to be bound by Santa Ana's promises and insisted the border lay farther north, at the Nueces River. To set it at the Rio Grande would, in effect, allow the United States to control land it had never occupied. In Mexico's eyes, therefore, President Polk violated its sovereign territory when he ordered U.S. troops into the disputed lands in 1846. From the Mexican perspective, it appeared the United States had invaded their nation. In January 1846, the U.S. force that was ordered to the banks of the Rio Grande to build a fort on the American side encountered a Mexican cavalry unit on patrol. Shots rang out and 16 U.S. soldiers were killed or wounded, angrily declaring that Mexico has invaded our territory and shed American blood upon American soil. President Polk demanded the United States declare war on Mexico. On May 12th, Congress obliged. The small but vocal anti-slavery faction decried the decision to go to war, arguing that Polk had deliberately provoked hostilities so the United States could annex more slave territory. Illinois Representative Abraham Lincoln and other members of Congress issued the Spot Resolutions in which they demanded to know the precise spot on U.S. soil where American blood had been spilled. Many Whigs also denounced the war. Democrats, however, supported Polk's decision, and volunteers for the Army came forward in droves from every part of the country except New England, the seat of abolitionist activity. Enthusiasm for the war was aided by the widely held belief that Mexico was a weak, impoverished country and that the Mexican people, perceived as ignorant, lazy, and controlled by a corrupt Roman Catholic clergy, would be easy to defeat. 
U.S. military strategy had three main objectives. First, take control of northern Mexico, including New Mexico. Second, seize California. And third, capture Mexico City. General Zachary Taylor and his Army of the Center were assigned to accomplish the first goal, and with superior weapons, they soon captured the Mexican city of Monterrey. Taylor quickly became a hero in the eyes of the American people, and Polk appointed him commander of all U.S. forces. General Stephen Watts Kearney, commander of the Army of the West, accepted the surrender of Santa Fe, New Mexico, and moved on to take control of California, leaving Colonel Sterling Price in command. Despite Kearney's assurances that New Mexicans need not fear for their lives or their property, the region's residents rose in revolt in January 1847 in an effort to drive the Americans away. Although Price managed to put an end to the rebellion, tensions remained high. Kearney, meanwhile, arrived in California to find it already in American hands through the joint efforts of California settlers, U.S. Naval Commander John D. Sloat and John C. Fremont, a former Army captain and son-in-law of Missouri Senator Thomas Benton. Sloat, at anchor off the coast of Mazatlan, learned that war had begun and quickly set sail for California. He seized the town of Monterey in July 1846, less than a month after a group of American settlers led by William B. I. D. had taken control of Sonoma and declared California a republic. A week after the fall of Monterey, the Navy took San Francisco with no resistance. Although some Californios staged a short-lived rebellion in September 1846, many others submitted to the U.S. takeover. Thus, Kearney had little to do other than take command of California as its governor. Leading the Army of the South was General Winfield Scott. Both Taylor and Scott were potential competitors for the presidency and believing correctly that whoever seized Mexico City would become a hero. Polk assigned Scott the campaign to avoid elevating the more popular Taylor, who was affectionately known as Old Rough and Ready. Scott captured Veracruz in March 1847, and moving in a northwesterly direction from there, much as Spanish conquistador Hernán Cortés had done in 1519, he slowly closed in on the capital. Every step of the way was a hard-fought victory, however, and Mexican soldiers and civilians both fought bravely to save their land from the American invaders. Mexico City's defenders, including young military cadets, fought to the end. According to legend, Cadet Juan Escutia's last act was to save the Mexican flag, and he leapt from the city's walls with it wrapped around his body. On September 14, 1847, Scott entered Mexico City's central plaza. The city had fallen. While Polk and other expansionists called for all Mexico, the Mexican government and the United States negotiated for peace in 1848, resulting in the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. The Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, signed in February 1848, was a triumph for American expansion, under which Mexico ceded nearly half its land to the United States. The Mexican Cession, as the conquest of land west of the Rio Grande was called, included the current states of California, New Mexico, Arizona, Nevada, Utah, and portions of Colorado and Wyoming. Mexico also recognized the Rio Grande as the border with the United States. The United States promised to grant Mexican citizens in the ceded territory U.S. citizenship in the future when the territories they were living in became states, and promised to recognize the Spanish land grants to the pueblos in New Mexico. In exchange, the United States agreed to assume $3.35 million worth of Mexican debts owed to U.S. citizens, paid Mexico $15 million for the loss of its land, and promised to guard the residents of the Mexican Cession from Native American raids. As extensive as the Mexican Cession was, some argued the United States should not be satisfied until it had taken all of Mexico. Many who were opposed to this idea were Southerners 
who, while desiring the annexation of more slave territory, did not want to make Mexico's large mestizo, people of mixed Native American and European ancestry, population part of the United States. Others did not want to absorb a large group of Roman Catholics. These expansionists could not accept the idea of new U.S. territory filled with mixed-race, Catholic populations. California and the Gold Rush The United States had no way of knowing that part of the land about to be ceded by Mexico had just become far more valuable than anyone could have imagined. On January 24, 1848, James Marshall discovered gold in the mill race of the sawmill he had built with his partner John Sutter on the South Fork of California's American River. Word quickly spread, and within a few weeks all of Sutter's employees had left to search for gold. When the news reached San Francisco, most of its inhabitants abandoned the town and headed for the American River. By the end of the year, thousands of California's residents had gone north to the gold fields with visions of wealth dancing in their heads, and in 1849, thousands of people from around the world followed them. The gold rush had begun. The fantasy of instant wealth induced a mass exodus to California. Settlers in Oregon and Utah rushed to the American River. Easterners sailed around the southern tip of South America or to Panama's Atlantic coast, where they crossed the Isthmus of Panama to the Pacific and booked ships passage for San Francisco. As California-bound vessels stopped in South American ports to take on food and fresh water, Hundreds of Peruvians and Chileans streamed aboard. Easterners who could not afford to sail to California crossed the continent on foot, on horseback, or in wagons. Others journeyed from as far away as Hawaii and Europe. Chinese people came as well, adding to the polyglot population in the California boomtowns. Once in California, gathered in camps with names like Drunkard's Bar, Angel's Camp, Gaojai and Whiskey Town, the 49ers did not find wealth so easy to come by as they had first imagined. Although some were able to find gold by panning for it, or shoveling soil from river bottoms into sieve like contraptions called rockers, most did not. The placer gold, the gold that had been washed down the mountains into streams and rivers, was quickly exhausted, and what remained was deep below ground. Independent miners were supplanted by companies that could afford not only to purchase hydraulic mining technology, but also to hire laborers to work the hills. The frustration of many a miner was expressed in the words of Sullivan Osborne. In 1857, Osborne wrote that he had arrived in California full of high hopes and bright anticipations of the future, only to find his dreams have long since perished. Although $550 million worth of gold was found in California between 1849 and 1850, very little of it went to individuals. Observers in the gold fields also reported abuse of Native Americans by miners. Some miners forced Native Americans to work their claims for them, others drove them off their lands, stole from them, and even murdered them as part of a systemic campaign of extermination. Some scholars view the resulting loss of Native American life as a clear example of genocide in the United States. Foreigners were generally disliked, especially those from South America. The most despised, however, were the thousands of Chinese migrants. Eager to earn money to send to their families in Hong Kong and southern China, they quickly earned a reputation as frugal men and hard workers who routinely took over diggings others had abandoned as worthless and worked them until every scrap of gold had been found. Many American miners, often spendthrifts, resented their presence and discriminated against them, believing the Chinese, who represented about 8% of the nearly 300,000 who arrived, were depriving them of the opportunity to make a living. In 1850, California imposed a tax on foreign miners, and in 1858, it prohibited all immigration from China. Those Chinese who remained in the face of the growing hostility were often beaten and killed, 
and some Westerners made a sport of cutting off Chinese men's cues, the long braids of hair worn down their backs. In 1882, Congress took up the power to restrict immigration by banning the further immigration of Chinese. As people flocked to California in 1849, the population of the new territory swelled from a few thousand to about 100,000. The new arrivals quickly organized themselves into communities and the trappings of civilized life, stores, saloons, libraries, stage lines, and fraternal lodges began to appear. Newspapers were established, and musicians, singers, and acting companies arrived to entertain the gold seekers. The epitome of these gold rush boom towns was San Francisco, which counted only a few hundred residents in 1846, but by 1850 had reached a population of 34,000. So quickly did the territory grow that by 1850, California was ready to enter the Union as a state. When it sought admission, however, the issue of slavery expansion and sectional tensions emerged once again. Eleven point five, free or slave soil, the dilemma of the West. Learning objectives. By the end of this section, you will be able to describe the terms of the Wilmot Proviso, discuss why the Free Soil Party objected to the westward expansion of slavery, explain why sectional and political divisions in the United States grew, describe the terms of the Compromise of eighteen fifty. The 1848 treaty with Mexico did not bring the United States domestic peace. Instead, the acquisition of new territory revived and intensified the debate over the future of slavery in the Western territories, widening the growing division between North and South and leading to the creation of new single-issue parties. Increasingly, the South came to regard itself as under attack by radical Northern abolitionists and many Northerners began to speak ominously of a Southern drive to dominate American politics for the purpose of protecting slaveholders' human property. As tensions mounted and both sides hurled accusations, national unity frayed. Compromise became nearly impossible, and antagonistic sectional rivalries replaced the idea of a unified democratic republic. The Liberty Party the Wilmot Proviso, and the anti-slavery movement. Committed to protecting white workers by keeping slavery out of the lands taken from Mexico, Pennsylvania Congressman David Wilmot attached to an 1846 revenue bill an amendment that would prohibit slavery in the new territory. The Wilmot Proviso was not entirely new. Other congressmen had drafted similar legislation, and Wilmot's language was largely copied from the 1787 Northwest Ordinance that had banned slavery in that territory. His ideas were very controversial in the 1840s, however, because his proposals would prevent American slaveholders from bringing what they viewed as their lawful property, enslaved people, into the Western lands. The measure passed the House, but was defeated in the Senate. When Polk tried again to raise revenue the following year to pay for lands taken from Mexico, the Wilmot Proviso was reintroduced, this time calling for the prohibition of slavery not only in the Mexican session, but in all U.S. territories. The revenue bill passed, but without the proviso. That Wilmot, a loyal Democrat, should attempt to counter the actions of a Democratic president hinted at the party divisions that were to come. The 1840s were a particularly active time in the creation and reorganization of political parties and constituencies, mainly because of discontent with the positions of the mainstream Whig and Democratic parties in regard to slavery and its extension into the territories. The first new party, the small and politically weak Liberty Party founded in 1840, was a single-issue party, as were many of those that followed it. Its members were abolitionists who fervently believed slavery was evil and should be ended, and that this was best accomplished by political means. The Wilmot Proviso captured the anti-slavery sentiments 
during and after the Mexican War. Anti-slavery advocates differed from the abolitionists. While abolitionists called for the end of slavery everywhere, anti-slavery advocates, for various reasons, did not challenge the presence of slavery in the states where it already existed. Those who supported anti-slavery fervently opposed its expansion westward because they argued slavery would degrade white labor and reduce its value, cast a stigma upon hard-working white people, and deprive them of a chance to advance economically. The Western lands, they argued, should be open to white men only, small farmers and urban workers for whom the West held the promise of economic advancement. Where slavery was entrenched, according to anti-slavery advocates, there was little land left for small farmers to purchase, and such men could not compete fairly with slaveholders who held large farms and gangs of enslaved people. Ordinary laborers suffered also. No one would pay a white man a decent wage when an enslaved person worked for nothing. When labor was associated with loss of freedom, anti-slavery supporters argued all white workers carried a stigma that marked them as little better than the enslaved. Wilmot opposed the extension of slavery into the Mexican session not because of his concern for African Americans, but because of his belief that slavery hurt white workers and that lands acquired by the government should be used to better the position of white small farmers and laborers. Work was not simply something that people did. It gave them dignity, but in a slave society, labor had no dignity. In response to these arguments, Southerners maintained that laborers in northern factories were treated worse than enslaved people. Their work was tedious and low-paid. Their meager income was spent on inadequate food, clothing, and shelter. There was no dignity in such a life. In contrast, they argued, southern enslaved people were provided with a home, the necessities of life, and the protection of their slaveholders. Factory owners did not care for or protect their employees in the same way. The Free Soil Party and the Election of 1848 The Wilmot Proviso was an issue of great importance to the Democrats. Would they pledge to support it? At the party's New York State Convention in Buffalo, Martin Van Buren's anti-slavery supporters called barn burners because they were likened to farmers who were willing to burn down their own barn to get rid of a rat infestation, spoke in favor of the proviso. Their opponents, known as hunkers, refused to support it. Angered, the barn burners organized their own convention, where they chose anti-slavery, pro-Wilmot proviso delegates to send to the Democrats' national convention in Baltimore. In this way, the controversy over the expansion of slavery divided the Democratic Party. At the National Convention, both sets of delegates were seated, the pro-proviso ones chosen by the barn burners and the anti-proviso ones chosen by the hunkers. When it came time to vote for the party's presidential nominee, the majority of votes were for Lewis Cass, an advocate of popular sovereignty. Popular sovereignty was the belief that citizens should be able to decide issues based on the principle of majority rule. In this case, residents of a territory should have the right to decide whether slavery would be allowed in it. Theoretically, this doctrine would allow slavery to become established in any U.S. territory, including those from which it had been banned by earlier laws. Disgusted by the result, the barn burners united with anti-slavery Whigs and former members of the Liberty Party to form a new political party, the Free Soil Party which took as its slogan, free soil, free speech, free labor, and free men. The party had one real goal, to oppose the extension of slavery into the territories. In the minds of its members and many other Northerners of the time, Southern slaveholders had marshaled their wealth and power to control national politics for the purpose of protecting the institution of slavery and extending it into the territories. Many in the Free Soil Party believed in this far-reaching conspiracy of the slaveholding elite to control both foreign affairs and domestic policies for their own ends, a cabal that came to be known as the slave power.
In the wake of the Mexican War, anti-slavery sentiment entered mainstream American politics when the new Free Soil Party promptly selected Martin Van Buren as its presidential candidate. For the first time, a national political party committed itself to the goal of stopping the expansion of slavery. The Democrats chose Lewis Cass, and the Whigs nominated General Zachary Taylor, as Polk had assumed they would. On Election Day, Democrats split their votes between Van Buren and Cass. With the strength of the Democratic vote diluted, Taylor won. His popularity with the American people served him well, and his status as a slaveholder helped him win the South. The Compromise of 1850 The election of 1848 did nothing to quell the controversy over whether slavery would advance into the Mexican session. Some slaveholders, like President Taylor, considered the question a moot point because the lands acquired from Mexico were far too dry for growing cotton, and therefore they thought no slaveholder would want to move there. Other Southerners, however, argued that the question was not whether slaveholders would want to move to the lands of the Mexican session, but whether they could and still retain control of their enslaved property. Denying them the right to freely relocate with their lawful property was, they maintained, unfair and unconstitutional. Northerners argued, just as fervidly, that because Mexico had abolished slavery, no enslaved people currently lived in the Mexican session, and to introduce slavery, there would extend it to a new territory, thus furthering the institution and giving the slave power more control over the United States. The strong current of anti-slavery sentiment, that is, the desire to protect white labor, only increased the opposition to the expansion of slavery into the West. Most Northerners, except members of the Free Soil Party, favored popular sovereignty for California and the New Mexico Territory. Many Southerners opposed this position, however, for they feared residents of these regions might choose to outlaw slavery. Some Southern politicians spoke ominously of secession from the United States. Free Soilers rejected popular sovereignty and demanded that slavery be permanently excluded from the territories. Beginning in January 1850, Congress worked for eight months on a compromise that might quiet the growing sectional conflict. Led by the aged Henry Clay, members finally agreed to the following. 1. California, which was ready to enter the Union, was admitted as a free state in accordance with its state constitution. 2. Popular sovereignty was to determine the status of slavery in New Mexico and Utah, even though Utah and part of New Mexico were north of the Missouri Compromise Line. 3. The slave trade was banned in the nation's capital. Slavery, however, was allowed to remain. 4. Under a new fugitive slave law, those who helped escaped enslaved individuals or refused to assist in their return would be fined and possibly imprisoned. 5. The border between Texas and New Mexico was established. The Compromise of 1850 brought temporary relief. It resolved the issue of slavery in the territories for the moment and prevented secession. The peace would not last, however. Instead of relieving tensions between North and South, it had actually made them worse. This has been U.S. History from OpenStax. OpenStax textbooks and this free audiobook are covered under a Creative Commons license. The full text is available at www.openstax.org. This project was made possible by CC Echo, the California Consortium for Equitable Change in Hispanic-Serving Institutions, Open Education Resources. You can learn more about CC Echo by visiting the link in this episode's show notes. You can find this audiobook anywhere you listen to podcasts, including Spotify, YouTube, Apple Podcasts, and more. Instructors can even download a course shell to embed these recordings in Canvas courses. Learn more by visiting www.openaudio.us. Did you find this audiobook helpful? If so, let us know by leaving a comment and sharing this recording with a colleague or a friend.